and uh, without wasting time i would be uh, glad to uh, introduce our second speaker and my own student i'm proud i'm also proud of dr atul definitely he's also i told you they all our original spices of india so i we cannot say so waha ja ke thoda seekh ke aaye to theek hai this is really good but basic knowledge is from india which really helps you so i'll be very happy uh, so can i introduce namrata please yeah so namrata was uh, she is actually at present working in uh, usa as a assistant professor department of occupational therapy thomas jemerson university philadelphia um and she uh, we have already said that uh, and uh, in fact namrata you were i think you were not there that time uh, dean of uh, uh, lm uh, ltmc uh, college that is lokmanya tilak uh, from where you graduated he was so proud of uh, hearing that uh, his own student is today the cme speaker so he was very proud so i want to congratulate you and uh, so she went to then uh, uh, us and she did further studies over there so and her topic is computer adaptive testing in occupational therapy innovative assessments for daily rehab which is i think a need of an hour uh, actually we i have uh, before also i said anything can happen any time so without wasting time namrata can you start your please want to make sure okay i have my Right, you guys can hear me. All right, great. Thank you. I am going to share my screen first so you all can see my PowerPoint. There we go. And I'm going to minimize my um, screen here so I can't see all of you, but um, I can definitely um, hear you all. So if you have anything or you want to stop me at any point, just um, please say something because i can't see you on the on the video <clears throat> i am really um excited to be here uh thank you to dr uh, bijlani for this uh, wonderful introduction and thanks to the dean of cyan as well i am a cyan graduate and a very proud cyan graduate at that because i've learned some really great skills in in india that really helped me um uh, move along in this journey here and and achieve some really good things that are meaningful to me and i hope i can bring them back to you uh, and we can all learn together uh, so i completed my masters at km with uh, dr anjali zoshi and my phd at university of washington with dr debbie carton um uh, as dr bijlani said i'm an assistant professor here at thomas jefferson my clinical experience in the united states has been mainly in the area of acute and inpatient rehab in the hospital setting um and my research interests are primarily in the area of assessment and measurement of function in individuals with neurological conditions I'm really fascinated with standardized assessment tools and how they have changed over time, how they continue to change with new technology and new statistical uh, methods, and how can we best use them in occupational therapy practice now with this um, new challenge of tele-rehab. So that's gonna be the, the focus uh, of my talk today. I do have some disclosures. I do receive grant funding. I consult with a private company and I'm also an affiliate research faculty at another institution. So what I hope for all of you to learn in this talk is get an understanding of the use of computer adaptive tests for tele-rehab and OT. The computer adaptive tests are commonly known as CATs in the field of assessment and those of you familiar with it uh, would refer to them as just CATs, so which is what I will do in my presentation today. So I hope you can bear with that acronym. Um, my uh, second objective for today is to identify the differences between adaptive and linear tests and help you understand those. Um, and for you to understand the science that underlies the development of CATs. Um, I would like for you to identify some of the CATs that are currently available and what you could use in your clinical setting on Monday morning when you arrive. 
Um, I think continuing education courses are meaningless if you can't have the tools to use them on Monday morning. So I hope you can come away with a cat that you can use and trial at least with your participants, with your clients in research or clinic on, on Monday. And then to identify the pros and cons of computer adaptive testing. So where do we uh, start? So let's start at the very beginning. So as I look at this uh, picture, I stop to think about the traditional assessments that we have used in occupational therapy. These are generally fixed length tests. And by fixed length, I mean you have 10 or 20 items. Um, you use those items, you administer them to your patients in the clinic, you administer all items to everyone, um, usually, and um, the test gives you a score. The score helps you in interpret about the ability of this patient on some uh, ability level for some construct, for some trait that you're trying to measure. This, these are how our traditional tests have looked like, and they have served us well for their purpose. But I think they have um, now outlived the growth in technology and statistical methods that we have seen over the last decade. So we have to keep up with technology and statistical innovations and move our tests beyond this fixed format of 10 to 20 questions and move them into this new realm of computer adaptive testing that uses item response theory type of methodology, which I will talk about in a little bit, um, and, and take our assessments to the next level. I think we are very passionate about taking our treatments to the next level, but I hope we can bring that enthusiasm to our assessment skills as well and move them from this traditional fixed length format into a computer adaptive uh, method in, in today and in the near future. So tele-rehab presents with many challenges. I equate it to shooting in the dark, which is what it really is. You do not have the patient right in front of you. You have an audio video to go by. So really you are limited to very few ways in which you can assess this patient. And you are very uh, familiar with all of your performance measures like range of motion, muscle testing, none of which are really available to you in the tele-rehab setting. And we uh, need measures that are optimal to be able to assess this patient's ability in this computerized environment, which is our new practice setting. So wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a world where measures were carefully selected for tele-rehab because many of the national agencies have a measurement uh, related criteria for telehealth and uh, in tele-rehab, which is an extension of telehealth, we need to prove that we are still able to provide services in, uh, in a justified and fair manner for our participants. So these measures can now become our eyes and ears in the clinic and we can use good quality measures that are accurate, that are developed for the computer, uh, computerized environment with our patients. So wouldn't it be nice to have such a measure that is accurate, short, and developed using the most current technology to be able to use with, with our patients? So how do we define computer adaptive tests? So computer adaptive test is a test administered by the computer that dynamically adjusts itself to the ability level of each test taker as the test is being administered. So the CAT is an algorithm. It's a software that uses psychometric equations for scoring and for selection of items. The really unique aspect is the test questions are tailored to the participants. So the text exp test experience is very unique to the person who's being exposed to these items and it's uh, quite person-centered. So to the right here, you can see a, a, uh, an image of how a computer adaptive test works. So the CAT presents a question uh, to the uh, person. And depending on the response to this question, the next question is presented. 
And then if they answer favorably to that question, a question at a higher difficulty is presented to the patient. And this goes on and on until the test ends and generates a score for the participant. Um, and the score would depend on how they answered uh, the questions in the test. And the questions would be unique to this person because the next question would depend on how they answered the previous one. So you can, some of the things you can see in this graphic is that these questions have to be then ordered or organized in some kind of a ranking. They have to have a way to be ranked from high to low ability or difficulty on that continuum. And if you look at our fixed length tests, they do have a hierarchy. I mean, you look at the items for a 10, 10 item scale, you as a therapist can figure out that there is some kind of a ranking, some kind of a hierarchy. Although the questions are usually not presented to us in that hierarchy to the patient, and even if they are, they will get progressively harder, which is not suitable for patient administ for administration to your patient. And so there, this ranking among the different questions in a computer adaptive test is essential for you to decide which next item to present to the participant. Now, thankfully, you don't have to do this because the computer algorithm makes that decision for you and the next question is presented automatically. So the computer adaptive test adapts to the level of the participant's ability. It's time efficient because time is not wasted in patients being exposed to questions that are irrelevant for them which is a complaint that I think all of us in therapy have had for a long time. Why do I have to give a patient a really, really hard uh, test item? When that test item, you know the patient's gonna fail on it. But to be fair to the patient, we have always given them an opportunity to perform on that item. Well, that's no longer needed in computer adaptive testing. Your patient will be given an item based on their own unique ability level, and they don't have to um, answer a question about stair climbing if they are not able to stand. So a patient who's unable to stand need not get an item about stair climbing. That is not where their ability level lies. And so making these tests individualized and patient-centered becomes really important as we develop new tests and develop modern methodologies to develop them. Um, I like this graphic because it kind of shows you how a person with low and high ability would perform on a computer adaptive test. So the person at the very top on this graphic is a person with a high ability. And the person at the lower, uh, the, uh, the bottom of this graphic is a person with low ability. So you can see that both of them took the same question, which was relatively at the middle difficulty level. Um, so 50 here we will consider as our middle difficulty of, uh, difficulty of the items. Um, and both of them answered the same question. Our person with high ability answered it well. And so they got another item that was higher in difficulty for them. And the person with lower ability got an item that was much lower in the ability because they were not able to answer the question as well as our person with high ability. And this went on and on until the person with high ability received a score of 60 and the person with low ability received a score of 30. So you can see these uh, two individuals only answered one question that was common to them. None of the other questions were similar among the two people. Now, this couldn't be any more person-centered uh, assessment than uh, what a CAT offers. So I think the CAT offers a really good way of making these items unique and relevant to the people we are testing. So some of the benefits that are outlined here are related to high accuracy of the test. And we will talk a little bit about standard errors of measurement. Um, the standard errors of measurement are quite low. We want a test with low measurement error. And the standard errors of measurement can be quite low for computer adaptive testing because we can ask the test to set a low standard uh, error of measurement. Uh, the areas that are measured are quite broad. 
Um, and it gives a good breadth of items across the entire ability spectrum from very low to very high ability. Relevant questions are presented to the uh, participants and uh, the questions are tailored. Thus, in the end, you're saving yourself a ton of time by using the right test for the right person. So moving on to the measurement science behind uh, computer adaptive testing. So one of the main concepts uh, here is calibrated item banks. So what calibrated item banks are is the questions that are in this test. Each of these, these questions uh, belong on a certain continuum on this ruler. So each question is given a value um, and that helps us rank these questions from really low to really high. So for example, on this graphic, you can see uh, a coming to stand question is right in the middle of this uh, continuum of ability. Whereas a stair climbing question to the very right is at the high end of ability on this continuum. And an item like washing face is on the very low level ability. So people even with low ability are able to do this item, but they're not necessarily able to do a stair climbing item. So in traditional tests, we have ignored this fact that our items can have some kind of a ranking. And, I, and uh, computer adaptive tests really utilize these rankings among the items to make a lot of decisions about which item needs to be presented. So calibrated item banks are nothing but items that have a value, a certain number associated with them that helps us decide if these items are um, uh, high on the ability spectrum or low. Um, in, for the items to be able to cover the entire range of ability, once we have these numbers associated with the items, the items can then um, help us identify areas where there is gaps. So if you have a standing item and a stair climbing item and you have no items in the middle, there is a huge gap in the ability level between those two items that can then be filled with new items. Um, and you can have a scale that doesn't have too many gaps in, uh, in the range of uh, items that cover the ability spectrum. So say physical fitness or physical function, you can have all different types of items uh, to suit the activities that the individuals perform. The other advantage here is that because these items get a value, we can objectively tell how close apart, how close or how apart these items are. That gives us an interval level scale. So if you go back to your uh, knowledge about um, the different types of uh, measurements, right? You have the nominal level scales, you have ordinal level scales, you have interval level scales and you have ratio level scales. So interval level scales give equal intervals between items and um, item response theory methods that are used in computer adaptive testing help you develop scales where the items are equally located and thereby giving you an interval level scale, which is the ideal scale to be used when you're doing fancy statistical calculations. Uh, your, um, your statistician would want you to use a scale that's, that has an interval level uh, measurement versus an ordinal or a nominal level measurement. So that's another advantage of a, of a computer adaptive test that's based on item response theory methods that you have an interval level scale now and the items are equidistant. So let's dig in a little bit about this new terminology that I just uh, introduced, which is item response theory. So there are two main theories that are used in developing tests. One is the classical test theory. And as the name suggests, that's the theory that has been used for our traditional tests. It's the classical method where the test scores, the total score, you have all the scores on the raw scores on your test, you add them up, and you get a total score for your test. This is a raw score. So raw scores or subscale scores 
are used in classical test theory methods. And it's all about that total score or the subscale score. The classical test theory ignores the individual items in a test. And that's where item response theory methods really shine. They give a lot of importance to the individual items and the raw scores are not used in any calculations in item response theory methods. So item response theory methods are of four different types. You have one parameter, which is the one P model, two parameter or the two P model, and so on. You have the three parameter, four parameter model. These are different types of item response theory methods. The most common among them is the one parameter model because it's the simplest. This model is also referred to as the RASH model. And I'm sure many of you have read papers in recent literature on measurement that talk about RASH models for analyzing uh, tests. The benefit of a RASH model is it can be used for computer adaptive testing and it can be used for analyzing the items in a fixed length format. So uh, what recent literature has done is taken your fixed length items from a test and analyze them using item response theory methods to generate these calibrated item banks. But when you do that, you see these glaring holes in a test because there are items that have been traditionally used and never calibrated. So you never uh, understood where the gaps in these items were. And what item response theory methods do is they develop these calibrated item banks, but they don't have 10 items or 20 items. They are usually between 50 to 1,000 items. So it's a very large item bank and an item pool from, uh, for us to select the items from. Because remember, we need items at all different levels on that ability ruler um, to be able to have a good uh, measurement scale. So let's um, look uh, at these parameters. So I referred to the different item response theory models as having one, two, three, or four parameters. So let's look in a little bit about what parameters actually mean. So the first parameter, which is used in RASH models or the one parameter models is called item difficulty, which is the easiest parameter to understand. Um, it's very easy to understand an easy item from a difficult item. So the difficulty parameter is the easiest to understand. It's denoted by a B in, uh, in the statistical literature. And you can see in this graph to the right that um, you have two items here. You have an item on standing up. You have another item on five minute walking. So what is the difference between these two items? They are at different uh, places on this graph. One is an easy item. So a standing item is an easier item and a five minute walking item is a harder item. You see on the X axis, the X axis has a scale in terms of theta. So theta is an estimate that's generated using the psychometric equations in uh, an item response theory uh, measure. And theta is in the units of logit. So logit is the unit in which the thetas are presented. And they range from, um, they can range from minus six to six or sometimes between minus three to three. So the theta is now our ability scale. So our x-axis is our ability scale. The scale shown here is a physical fitness uh, test. And uh, the standing up item is an easy item for physical fitness for participants on which this test was uh, designed and uh, tested on. And the five minute walking was a difficult test. The y-axis is the probability that the item is endorsed. So the items that I'm showing you are dichotomous items, which means they have two response uh, options. Can you stand up? Yes or no. Can you walk for five minutes? Yes or no. So these are yes and no items, dichotomous. And um, people who said yes for the standing up item, you can see that the, at the, even at the lower level of ability, people are able to answer yes to the standing up item. And this yeses, these yeses keep increasing across the ability spectrum. 
And when you go from middle to a high ability, you can see how almost everyone said yes to the standing up item, which makes sense to us, right? In therapy, you would hope that um, people with middle to uh, high ability would answer yes to a standing up um, item. And so this item is doing really well for those with middle to high ability level. Now, as opposed to that, the five minute walking item, it's not a very easy item. People start answering yes for this item at about the one theta or the one logit uh, mark. And they keep answering yes until they reach um, a, a value close to the very high ability. So five minute walking uh, item is a more difficult item than a standing up item. We couldn't have done this with traditional tests. We couldn't have looked at each item to help us decide how easy or difficult this item is for the participants. So the uh, item response theory methods do offer us an advantage in terms of being able to really scrutinize and look at the items carefully. So the next parameter is discrimination. Discrimination is based on the slope of these curves. So if you look at that middle point where the, where the vertical line is drawn, uh, when you take the slope at this point, um, the item discrimination can be uh, uh, calculated. And item discrimination for now, these both of these items appears to be the same. And what discrimination or the slope tells us is how well is the item able to discriminate people of high and low ability. So if you take at this, this cutoff point, the middle point, um, you can see that this item, the slope is rising all the way from a theta of minus five to a theta of about a zero. This is a very large range. And this item is not a very good cutoff score item for high versus low ability. People are answering yes to this item or no to this item at various different theta estimates. If this had a much steeper slope or it was more vertical, um, you would be able to say that this item had a better, uh, could better function as a cutoff score item where it would be able to discriminate people between high and low ability levels. So these are not items with very good uh, discrimination. Um, but what I wanted to uh, point out was that the slope of these curves is what that second parameter is, which is disc discrimination. So let's look at a few more graphs as we move on. So I hope you can um, tolerate some more graphs. I do have a lot of graphs and I hope that they will help you understand when you go back and read some of the literature on measurement articles uh, related to item response theory and computer adaptive testing. These are the kinds of graphs that will help you really understand how the items and the test is doing. So if you remember the one parameter model is based on item difficulty. You can see a couple different items here and how each item falls on a different continuum from um, about negative 1.5 to positive 1.5 range of ability. And so these items are really nicely distributed uh, along the continuum. This is a nice scale. If you wanted to measure people in that middle ability level from 1.5 to, uh, from negative 1.5 to positive 1.5. So if you notice the slopes of these lines are not changing. So this is a one parameter model. We are ignoring discrimination. So we are not looking at the slopes of these lines in a one parameter model. So when you go to a two parameter model, it gives you much more information about these items. Now you see that where these items looked all at all, all looked quite similar. Here they start looking quite different because their slopes are different. And the way you would look at this graph is the first two items um, are do not have a very steep slope. But if you see the third item that has a steeper slope than the first two, one would like to think that this third and the fourth item are doing much better with discriminating between high and low ability level than these two items, which are 
much more flat than, than these two curves. So a two parameter mo model gives you difficulty and discrimination, both parameters. Now, not all of our items are dichotomous. Uh, many of the scales we use have many different response categories and having multiple response categories really creates a challenge when we uh, look at uh, items and their information that's generated in item response theory. So this item is from a mental health scale. The item reads, do you have a lot of energy? So I want you to take a minute and answer this question for yourself and read the response options carefully. All right, good. So those of you who are able to do this exercise, you realized that when you tried to answer this question, um, if you were slightly confused between what's going on with option two, three, and four, um, you're not alone. Because one would like to think that little of the time, some of the time, they're yeah, kind of similar. I don't know what to answer if I'm looking at these options, little, some, a good bit. But I know what to answer for none of the time and all of the time. Even most of the time is, is fairly good but I don't know what's going on here in the middle. There are too many response options. Now, if I was to run this item, so you did a qualitative assessment. You, you tried to uh, see how the item is doing and how the response options are doing. Now let's put this item through an item response theory uh, software and generate some graphs. So the graphs that you see on the right, um, the graph at the top is not for this item. It's an ideal response curve. This is what you would want the response curve to look like. So the, the x-axis again is our theta, which is the ability level from low, which is minus three, to high, which is three. And the um, y-axis is the probability of endorsing that particular uh, response option. So how many people said uh, zero, how many people said one? So how many people selected that response option? So in reality, you would like to have these nice, beautiful ideal response curves where there are lots of people answering lots of different uh, responses. They are nice, well apart. They are uh, good slopes, they are pointed. So you would wanna see these beautiful response curves. But when you look at the item that we just uh, tried to answer, you get a response curve that looks like the one at the bottom. This response curve, you can see there's something clearly going on here. Um, they don't all look as pretty as the top graph. Um, the end items, the end responses, which is none of the time and all of the time seem to be doing fairly good. The option most of the time is not as bad. It has a nice uh, curve to it. It's pretty high, so it's giving us a lot of information. But look what's happening to the responses, little of the time, some of the time, and a good bit of the time. Clearly not many people are even choosing those options. They are too close to one another, so they're not uh, spread apart. There is not a good cutoff between those items. So as an item developer, you would look at this graph and say that this item really needs some work in terms of those three response categories. So what you looked at qualitatively, you were able to verify that quantitatively and fix this item in some way. So that's another strength of item response theory. You can keep adding new items. You can keep changing response scales over time. You're not limited to a fixed format that's once released is out there in the open. The items can be changed. The items can be modified as we go on. Now, those of you who have, um, and most of you who have taken standardized tests are already aware that the field of education has gone much beyond uh, this realm and has already started using computer adaptive testing. So GRE is one example of a computer adaptive test. And so now you know what I'm talking about. These are 
tests that uh, multiple millions of test takers are taking them each year. And they have already used this methodology fairly successfully for very large um, pool of participants. Um, and clearly they have uh, great advantages uh, and great accuracy in terms of measurement. One of them mainly being the ability to change and modify and adapt these items, which is what we have needed in many of the traditional tests. I mean, how many times you open a test and you say, well, that item is just not relevant in today's world and not much can be done about it. But if we used computer adaptive testing, new items can be added. Response categories can be merged. Um, and so there are uh, a lot of advantages to using computer adaptive testing. Um, I scrolled too fast, but I wanted to introduce you to these five core components of a computer adaptive test, some of which we have already uh, discussed. So the first one is a calibrated item bank that I explained to you. The next is starting rule. At what point does the test start? Next is the item selection rule, which is which item will go next. So how does one decide which item would go next? Um, next is the scoring rule. How are the scores calculated? And what's the stopping rule? When will the test stop? Now, why do I as a therapist need to know all this? Well, I do need to know this because this will help me decide if the test is gonna really be appropriate for the purpose that I'm using the test for. So to be an informed and knowledgeable therapist administering the test, familiarity with these concepts will make you a much more adept uh, practitioner um, and knowledgeable in using the tests that you're administering with your participants. So let's dig in a little bit more into calibrated item banks. Now, I did tell you that when there are multiple items in a test, each item gets kind of a score or a value that helps me rank these items from low to high. We all understand that. But what is unique about item response theory is the people are also assigned this theta score. So as the person answers this question, the person also gets a theta estimate. And in reality, items and people all fall on the same scale, which is a very difficult concept for us to understand because how can people and items all fall on the same scale? But what happens is when a person answers a question at that say negative 1.5 theta estimate level, the person also gets a theta estimate of negative 1.5. Then when the next question is answered, this theta estimate is now adjusted to a new mark and the person and the items fall on the same scale. This has never happened in traditional uh, tests where people and items all fall on the same unit, which is theta in, in, in logits. And so this is a difficult concept to understand for uh, calibrated item banks. And it helps us understand the, the tests much better once we understand that people and items all fall on the same scale. So in a, to be able to match items to people, it is necessary to match items to people. And this matching requires a calibrated item bank. Now there are different types of tests. Some tests, we want to know the ability level, like what is the physical function for this individual, but there are other tests like the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, where you need cutoffs. You need to know uh, how people uh, differentiate between high and low ability. So in those cases, depending on the purpose of the test, the items will need to be designed to either have a wide spread like, right, like the graph shown here on the right. In this graph, and I'll explain the graph in a little bit more, but the items have to be spread out when you want an ability uh, estimate for an individual. But when you want a cutoff, the items at that particular level of cutoff, 
score. There have to be many items. They have to be very good items, items with very high discrimination so that they will be able to give you a nice estimate of cutoff between low and high ability. So the purpose of the test becomes very important in uh, item response theory methods because that will help you decide where you want the items uh, to be mostly populated. Do you want them spread all around? Do you want them spread at the middle level where you have the cutoff? Those are the decisions that uh, when you're developing computer adaptive tests, uh, one has to make. Now, to tell you a little bit more about the graph on the right, this is a little different from the graphs we've looked at. The graphs we've looked at are called item information functions. Um, but the graph that we are looking at now is a test information function. So the x-axis again is the theta estimate, uh, which has not changed since we started looking at these graphs. It ranges from minus three low ability to high, which is high ability uh, of three. The red curve here is the test information function. And the red curve is where all of the items on the test lie. So you can see that in this test, the items are nicely spread out between high to low ability, but look what's happening at the two ends of ability. We are not able to estimate quite as well uh, at the very low or the very high level of ability. So if your patient walks in and you're using this scale, you can use it for an average patient who walks in, but a patient with very low ability or very high ability, this would not be an appropriate scale for you to use. Um, the other thing that's of note in this graph is this blue curve. So the blue curve is the standard error of measurement. Now, if you remember, um, I mentioned that item response theory uh, gives you the standard error of measurement instantaneously. So as soon as you take this item, you get to know what the standard error of measurement is. All tools have errors. Um, and it is a good idea to always look at what that level of error is in estimating the ability of the individual. So what we can see here in this blue curve is that the standard error is inverse of that of the test information. So as the information increases, the error goes down. So at this middle level where the information is quite high, the test information, the standard errors are quite low. The scale is doing really beautifully between minus two and two. But now look at the very high end. Your test is not doing so well because you neither have high information, uh, but you also, you don't have high information, but you also have a very high standard error, which would be unacceptable. So you would definitely not use this test for individuals who have very high ability. But what is happening at the low ability is it's not doing as poorly as it was doing for those with high ability. The standard errors are not as high. They are worse than what they were for your middle ability people, but for your low ability people, it's not that bad as compared to the high ability. So that gives you a good idea of how you would look at a scale and decide uh, when and how to use it for in clinical practice. Um, so in traditional tests, when a person is given a score from zero to 100, zero being bad and 100 being good, a score of 95 would mean very high ability. But this item endorsement, which is an item score from zero to 100% um, uh, of endorsement would not make sense uh, with a value of 95 if, uh, because that would mean the item was too easy for the test takers. So the traditional paper pencil tests don't serve us well when we try to use them for item analysis, even though people have tried to do that using uh, classical test theory methods. So moving on to the starting rule. So there are many different ways in which starting rules can be applied. The one that I discussed before was everyone starts at the same level. This is quite common. Everyone starts at that middle ability, which is usually a theta of zero logits. So everyone starts at that same theta, everyone gets the same question, 
And then depending on how they answer that question, then the next one is presented. This is the most common starting rule. But there are other issues that might influence where you start a test. One of them is item exposure. So um, for tests like cognitive assessment, you don't want your items to be exposed to a lot of people uh, and avoid cheating. So if you want items to be hidden from uh, common knowledge, you want a random theta estimate where the test would start. So the theta estimate you can uh, assign could be like minus 0.5 to positive 0.5 and the computer algorithm picks a random item between that estimate to be the starting item. So the person cannot cheat because the last time they took the test, there was a certain item on the test. This becomes important in educational testing, but I think it's quite relevant even for certain rehab scales that we use. Um, the starting rules can also change based on um, a few other criteria, for example, admission score. So you are giving a CAT to a participant at discharge, but at admission, this person was very low on the ability. Um, if you enter there, if the CAT already knows the admission scores, the CAT can be tailored to adjust to the admission scores so that this person will not be given an item of very high ability at discharge. And so the, the test can adjust to admission scores, to whatever their baseline scores are, to demographical data, men or women, to, um, to different age groups. And this is where age-related norms come into play. So because the computer algorithm makes all of these decisions and the burden on the therapist is not really huge, you can have many different types of um, ways in which the test can start and you can make it more relevant and take into account the different age-related norms um, in the test. The graph on the right is not related to starting rules, but I thought I'll just put in some more test information functions since now I think we're getting good at looking at some of these test information functions. So look at this blue curve. What you see compared to this curve that we saw, the blue curve, which is now the test information in this graph, shows you that this blue curve is really good at detecting the ability levels from middle to high. It's not that great from low to middle. It's almost, it has very high error and very low information. So this is not a great scale uh, to be used for those with even middle to low ability. Uh, but for those with high ability, this is a fantastic scale uh, for us to use um, and with very low standard errors. So just another example of how a test information uh, uh, looks like. The other thing you notice when compared to this previous graph is that this curve is more pointed. And a pointed curve indicates that at this particular point, the test is able to really um, give us a lot of information to be able to put, draw a line and create a cutoff between high and, uh, and moderate ability for the participants. So this, this test is doing a little more than just ability estimation. It's, it's getting close to creating some kind of a cutoff. Right, moving on. So cats have to decide how to select items and item selection, as I described, is based on the value that the item gets. And when we include multiple different parameters, because each item would have a theta for difficulty, it would have a discrimination parameter, you are uh, required to use uh, the curves of uh, which are called Fisher information curves to inform which is the next item that the cat will select. Again, therapists do not have to do any of this the algorithm does it uh, for you. So item selection is also based on the curves uh, that we looked at. The scoring rule. Um, so in order to score um, a test, um, the maximum likelihood estimate of the theta, which is a statistical technique, is used in estimating uh, the scores. 
So the scores are estimates. Usually, um, if we were given scores on theta from minus six to six, it just wouldn't make any sense for us. So the scores are converted into a much more user-friendly scale from zero to 100, where 50 is the average and 10 is the standard deviation. That's uh, a T-score. A T-score is very easy for people to understand. And so most GATs will give you a T-score to make it really easy for you and your patient to understand what the report looks like. Um, so for cutoff scores, because we don't get a certain score, you do get a confidence interval. So once, so say for a score, uh, for a test of uh, dementia, where we are able to discriminate between people with dementia and no dementia, you will get a confidence interval uh, at, uh, instead of a score when you're using uh, scoring for tests that have cutoff scores. All right. Now to distract you with another graph, um, this is a test information function for a different scale. And look how this looks like. It's giving us a lot more information between the middle to the low end of the scale and very low standard errors. But again, from middle to high, this scale is not doing well at all. So you wouldn't use this scale for those with middle to high difficulty. So there is a little bit of therapist judgment in trying to select the tests, even though uh, the software does take care of a lot of uh, uh, matching with the person's ability. It does not mean that the, the choice of the test um, is not under therapist control. The therapists have to be knowledgeable to be able to select the right test um, and, and we can depend on the software um, for, for all of the um, for, for the test selection, even though the, uh, the software does really good item level selection. So how does a test stop? So usually computer adaptive tests are designed to stop at a level of accuracy. So we can give it a standard error value of uh, say 1.5. Once the test reaches a standard error of 1.5, the test must stop. What that means is the tests become variable lengths. So a, one person might get five items, another person might get 10 items. If this person was quite good at answering the questions to their ability level, the test stops quickly because the software is able to get to that standard error of measurement really quickly. But for someone, who has much more variable performance, it takes a little bit more time for the test to reach that standard error of measurement uh, that we have assigned to the test to be able to give a, an accurate score. Accurate meaning at the, at the level of accuracy that we set. And this ability to be able to set the level of accuracy, I think is the strongest point of a computer adaptive test. Having variable test lengths is not a concept we are used to. So it takes a little while to get used to tests that have variable lengths for us and for the patients. Um, another way of uh, doing uh, of a stopping rule is to assign um, fixed number of items. So one can assign um, fixed items and say that uh, at 15 items, the test can stop. But that's rare because then you would have to pay attention to what the standard error of measurement is. Um, I would like to show you a computer adaptive test now uh, that you can use. If, I, uh, if you remember, I told you on Monday morning, a test that you can go use in your clinic and try it on. So this test comes from the National Institute of, Institutes of Health Promise uh, Initiative. Uh, and is on the health measures database. So I'm going to the website, www.healthmeasures.net. Now, if this is your first time visiting this site, you'll have to create a free account. I already have an account with the site. Under uh, explore measurement systems, I went to promise. Under promise, I went to a promise cat demo. So it shows me all the different computer adaptive tests. This trial version is free. You can use it at any time. 
It doesn't save any data because it's a trial version. I select the scale I wanna use, which for now I will select physical function. I will enter my age because remember these are age related norms. So I'm gonna select an age, I'm gonna select a gender and hit next. It gives me an item. It asks me, does your health now limit you in doing two hours of physical labor? I'm gonna say not at all. Does your health limit you in doing strenuous activities? I'm gonna say very little. Does your health limit you in hiking a couple of miles? I'm gonna say very little. Scrubbing floors, well, we do that all the time. So I'm gonna say not at all. Wow, it was able to estimate my score pretty quickly in those few questions. And it generates this report that tells me what date I took the test, my age, my gender, which type of test did I take, and my score. So if you remember, this is a T-score. I got a 53, where the average for my age and gender was 50. I got a score of 53. So it gives you this really streamlined score that you can then print out, put it in your documentation, and move on to your next participant. So the Promise Cats, I would highly, highly recommend you to visit the Promise website at healthmeasures.net. I don't get any money for promoting them. They are a, a national initiative here that um, we are promoting across all, all rehab. Um, so we talked about many of the benefits of uh, computer adaptive tests being efficiency, motivation of patients, uh, using modern technology and storage on a database. We also talked about what are the, some of the differences between adaptive and linear tests. Adaptive tests having variable format, a linear test having fixed number of items. Um, and one of the main differences is that the test can grow an adaptive test can grow a linear test has fixed items and needs new versions in order to be uh, developed. Um, uh, tests uh, developed using item response theory can also be linked to other tests where the scores can be transformed from one test onto another, which is a topic of interest uh, of mine as well. And it's a whole another talk, but I would, I would like to present that as, uh, as a, uh, as another benefit of using adaptive tests. So some of the research I have done has involved the cerebral palsy uh, uh, profile of health and function, which is a computer adaptive test. I uh, focused on the upper extremity domain, which has 55 items in the calibrated item bank. We knew that it had a test retest reliability of ICC of 0.86, concurrent validity with the existing tests like the VFIM and the uh, PODC uh, of 0.85. Uh, an example item is my child can remove his or her hat or cap, an upper extremity item. This is a parent reported measure for cerebral palsy. We did this uh, measure implemented at Shriners Hospitals for Children um, before and after upper extremity functional surgery. We had children with a mean age of 11, and uh, we had about 90 children in this study. And we found that the CP Pro CAT was quite effective with an effect size of 0 0.40. This effect size was much greater than all of the traditional tests at all different time points, three months, six months, 12 months. Just goes to show you that the test can be so much more sensitive because it has a lot more items and greater accuracy. There, none, no research goes without limitations. Computer adaptive tests have their own limitations. One of them being uh, really large sample sizes are needed for these studies. Um, and the, there is cost to the software. So those are the two main limitations of computer adaptive tests that make it really difficult for widespread use. But we have a way of overcoming these limitations. There are something called as short forms that have been developed based on the calibrated item banks. And I would encourage you to go to the Promise website and look at some of these short forms because they function as fixed length tests. Not ideal, but at least they come from calibrated item banks. 
And I would encourage you to go on the Promise website, it's free, and download some of these short forms and try them with your patients. They are available in 11 Indian languages, uh, Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi, Malayalam, Marathi, Nepali, so many Indian languages, uh, these tests are available. Uh, and many large health systems here in the United States are beginning to adopt them. So what are some of the questions that you would ask when selecting computer adaptive tests? Um, so here is a few, you would begin with general questions. What evidence is behind it? What is the cost? Do I need internet? Does the patient need to complete the test remotely? And are short forms available? Some of the same things we have discussed thus far. These are some of the currently available computer adaptive tests. If you have a phone, I would encourage you to take a picture of this. One of these tests I'm sure might fit with the population that you work with. I mainly work with neurological conditions. So I must say other than the burn recovery scale, um, none of the other ones, um, all of the other ones are uh, for neurological conditions. So what's the future? There is a cost to cats, and we have to justify why those costs are essential. We have to invest in government or healthcare ventures to make these cats freely available to people. And uh, we have to focus on using short forms uh, in the interim until all of the cats are available to people. We need to disseminate the knowledge about these uh, cats uh, in formats like the one I'm using today. We need to train our students and therapists to be able to have the resources to access CATS. So I hope some of the objectives that I set out for today were achieved in this talk. And um, I would like to thank uh, my core team, which is Dr. Mulcahy, Dr. Graves at the Center for Outcomes and Measurement, at Thomas Jefferson, and my favorite people, Dr. Bijlani, Dr. Joshi, and Dr. Uh, Jagirdar for their uh, invitation to this conference. Um, that's my email. So please feel free to reach out with questions um, that you may have. I would like to end there and open up uh, to the moderators if there are any questions in the Q&A. Thank We can't hear you, you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see. At present, there are no questions, but I, I feel it is some delay happening from question answer box to our chat box. So is anybody ha has some questions uh, from the, no, definitely I can't ask from the audience, but at present I can't see anyone, but uh, uh, Namrata, what I feel. Can I just interrupt? I yeah. do see a question. But I can't, that is the issue. Okay, you, you can go through it, please. Thank you, please. Uh, there's just one question, so I might just answer that one. Yes, yes, please. Um, so the question from Navita is that if the questions are not similar for all users, then could CATS be used for research purposes? Um, so very interesting question. Thank you, Navita. The answer is yes, because CATS are interval level scales. They are actually quite uh, useful for research purposes. And the reason CATS were developed originally was for research. Uh, the clinical applications have developed only in recent days. So CATs are quite suitable for research applications, even with variable uh, questions. So thank you for letting me answer that. I think one more is there, I think. I do not no, see any. No, no. Okay, there's no one. No, I, I got some uh, questions in the chat box. Just go. let me go through it. Yeah. Ah, no, those questions are not for you. Thank you. Those were for the 
speakers, previous speakers. Any more questions? No. Please write immediately. If you want to write, please. Anyway, I will, uh, in case you have more questions, you can mail uh, Namrata. She will definitely be happy to answer you on mail. Uh, or even if, I don't know if she allows, then even on WhatsApp. Uh, thanks a lot, Namrata. Something great, something different, what we really need it um, now uh, on such uh, um, computer adaptive uh, assessment. And I took, as you, what I say, that it has become a need of the uh, day. So thanks a lot. And I'm sure uh, we will keep on having more and more lectures on such uh, type of things because you said you would like to continue with some other things also. So I'm waiting that uh, uh, once the, uh, we, the time permits after the conference, we'll definitely again invite you. Thanks a lot. They were really, really, I'm sure it will be very useful to all the occupational therapists uh, who are interested in this. So thanks a lot.